In these days of the pandemic, uh, occasionally people use the word apocalyptic to talk about our time. Apocalypse, apocalyptic, and of course what they mean by that is some sort of uh, catastrophe, end of the world, or something like that. But this word comes to us from the Bible, so maybe it's good to turn to the Bible to try to find out what is it. The last book of the Bible is called in Greek, the title is Apocalypsis Jesu Christo, the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. What does this mean? The word apocalypse comes from the word uh, kaluma or kalyptra, which means a veil, and apocalypsis is an unveiling, taking off a veil. In Latin we translate it re velare, velam is veil, and take off a veil. So the idea is uh, that the way we see reality normally is through a veil. And in order to see things the way they are, we have to take off the veil. What is the uh, veil that causes us not to see reality the way it is? Uh, probably we could say very simply our self-centered outlook. We don't see things the way they are. We see things filtered through our own desires, our own wishes, our own fears, both individually and collectively. Our, our limited knowledge, the limited knowledge of our culture, um, our own particular outlook on things. So we don't see things the way they are, and to, we have a kind of filter, a kind of veil, and that has to be taken off. How is it taken off? Well, the words that follow are Jesu Christu, that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Now, the Bible scholars discuss whether this is an objective or a subjective gen genitive. In other words, is Jesus the one who reveals, who takes off the veil, or is what we see when we take off the veil Jesus? And the answer is both. Jesus shows us reality, and he shows us reality by showing us himself. In his life, in his existence, we discover the true meaning of life. In the second letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul says something similar. He says that when the old people in the Old Testament read Scripture, they read it through a veil. He plays on a text from the Old Testament where Moses supposedly came down from Sinai with a veil over his face. And so uh, uh, he says uh, when people read the Bible, they see it through a veil. And he's, then Paul has these words. When someone turns to Christ, the veil is taken away. Very similar thing to what the Apocalypse wants to tell us. When we turn to Christ, we discover the meaning of life, we discover uh, what reality is, is all about. Now, how does this unveiling take place? Well, in the Gospels, this uh, revelation of reality comes by telling us stories about the life of Jesus. We, it's a kind of biography of Jesus that shows us how, what his, the meaning of his life is, and he reveals to us the meaning of our life. In the Apocalypse, it happens in a different way, in this book of Revelation, through symbols, through visions. That's why the book is a very difficult and strange book for many people. Well, uh, it's good to know that it is a particular kind of literature. One of the mistakes people make sometime is to imagine that it's like a, 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 normal, uh, a normal work of literature. It would be a little bit like if you open a book of science fiction and you, you think it's a newspaper account of what's really happening. Of course, it, you'd get all confused. It's not at all that way. It's, it, it, it's a special kind of literature which has to be interpreted, so it's a kind of... Uh, through visions, through symbols, through images, and it needs to be interpreted. Another image that might help us to understand or if when we, when we go to a, uh, the hospital and they make some tests on us, they look at our bodies through these special machines, these apparatus, they do a sonogram, and on the sonogram we see not what we see with our naked eyes, but we see something else. But at the same time, what we see on the screen has to be interpreted. If, if we just look at these strange shapes on the screen and we say, this is me, we'll be a little bit lost. So uh, there are these symbols and images, but it's not immediately sure what they mean. Well, that's the bad news. It needs, we need a work of interpretation. The good news is that uh, most of the symbols, almost all of the symbols in this book, 
come from the Old Testament, come from the Hebrew Scriptures, and in fact show us uh, the truer meaning of a lot of these symbols that we find throughout Scripture. Let me give you one very central example in the Apocalypse. It's the image of a lamb, the lamb. At, the, in the, at one point in the Apocalypse, uh, John says, I saw a lamb in the middle of God's throne looking as if it had been slaughtered. Well, what's a lamb? And if we go back to the Hebrew Scriptures, first of all, people raised sheep and goats to, to give them milk and to give them wool and to eat and so on. And so it was necessary for survival. But the most common use of a lamb we find in Scripture is to make an offering to God. People took some of the best that they had and they offered it to God uh, as a, what we call a sacrifice, a gift to God. Uh, of course, you can't really give a gift to God. God no one has ever seen, so people did it in a symbolic way. They brought it to a holy place and they gave the animal or the, the plants to a, a person who took it in the name of God and uh, either burnt it up and the smoke went up to the sky as if this was going to be used for God, or sometimes if the animal was killed, there was a meal, and it was a sacred meal where people were sharing food with, with God or with the gods. So we see lambs used as offerings to God, and of course there's one very important time when a lamb is used, and that's the Passover celebration, when the people of Israel were coming out of their slavery right before they celebrated this feast. We find it in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. They, they had the um, uh, Passover celebration. At the center of the Passover celebration was a lamb, a very spotless, good lamb. You give God the best of what you have. And it was sacrificed to God, and then it was taken and eaten by the people in a kind of sacred meal. So this gift of the lamb created a link between the people and God. But also in this Exodus story, the blood of the lamb, the life of the lamb which was given, is put on the doors, uh, doorposts of the houses to protect people from destruction. So it's also the blood of the lamb was used uh, for a uh, kind of protection against destruction. So we have this first image of the lamb. And later on there's another uh, way the lamb is used in, in the prophetic books, the prophet Jeremiah talks about when he tried to proclaim God's word to uh, the people, he was rejected, he was persecuted. And he, was, he says, I was very naive, I thought they would listen, but in fact they didn't listen to me, and so they persecuted me, they attacked me, and he said I was like a gentle lamb being led to the slaughter. I didn't know what was going on, and uh, my naivete, my innocence was wounded. So he uses this image, now here it's not directly a sacrifice, but it's used as an image of uh, someone innocent who is trying to do God's work and is persecuted. Then we go to the book of Isaiah, to these famous texts of the servants of God in chapter 53, and we find the two, the two lines come together. Isaiah also calls, him, calls himself, I can read, uh, Chapter 53, verse 7, talks about this mysterious figure of the servant. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. So the servant is like Jeremiah even more. He was put to death, he was persecuted, but he didn't respond to violence with violence, to evil with evil. A little bit later in this chapter, he's compared to a sacrifice for sin. So we see the two sides of the image of the lamb come together. Um, when uh, in, the, in the New Testament, when St. Peter in his first letter speaks about Jesus, he quotes this text and he calls Jesus this spotless lamb. He says, when he was abused, he didn't return abuse. He trusted in the one who would deliver him. So it's applied to Jesus. And of course, we know that in John's gospel, when uh, the, John the Baptist sees Jesus, the first words he says are, there is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So if we go through all of this, and now we come back to the apocalypse, when John in his vision sees a lamb standing in the middle of God's throne, looking as if it had been slaughtered, we understand the depths of this image. Jesus is the true lamb of God. Jesus is the one who 
gives his life for us to create this communion, this relationship between us and God. He does it not by responding to evil with evil, but by responding to evil with love. So one example of how the apocalypse can take a symbol and show its deeper meaning in the light of the mystery of Christ, but based on the Hebrew scriptures. Of course, the, it's also important to realize that when the apocalypse picks up these images, it sometimes changes the meaning. For example, one of the uh, commonest images in the apocalypse, which makes it difficult for many people, are war images, images of battle, of destruction, of war. Uh, and, uh, uh, but again, here we have to realize that here too, we're not supposed to take these images literally. We're supposed to try to find a deeper meaning. For example, the verb to conquer. In the first part of the book, it always talks about the one who conquers um, the seven messages to the different communities say, to those who conquer, I will give. And so we could have this image of someone destroying their enemies. But in the fourth message, the middle of the, the seven messages, if we read it carefully, it says, to the one who conquers and who keeps until the end my works, who does my works till the end. So we discover that to conquer in this book then means to be faithful to Christ to the end, even to give our life if necessary for our faith. So this faithfulness to the end is what it means to conquer. So you, you take an image of war and violence and give it a completely uh, different, almost opposed meaning. So and that's important to take into account when we start to look at the texts. The other thing to, rem to realize with these combinations, often different images are put together and they sometimes make a kind of, kind of paradox or kind of very strange things. For example, a little bit later in the book, and this is a very comic, image, if we take it literally, uh, people are given white robes to share. They're the ones who are following Christ, who are being faithful. And they, white is the color of heaven, the color of God, so they're given white robes. They share in Jesus' victory over death. They share in this new life. And someone asks, how are these robes been made white? And, it, and the answer is, they're robes who are made white because they washed them in the blood of the Lamb. Well, obviously, if you wash something in blood, it's not going to turn white. But you, you have to see, again, we're not talking about a liter literal description. We're using different images to tell a spirit, to give a deeper spiritual meaning. Last thing I'd like to say in this first introduction to the apocalypse is the question of time. Uh, often, uh, the pro uh, at the beginning of the book, it's called a prophecy, the words of this prophecy. And many people commonly think of prophecy as foretelling the future, but we know if we study scripture that a prophet isn't someone who first of all tells the future, a prophet is someone who communicates God's word to people uh, and tells them how they should act in a certain situation. So they, they, they say, what is God saying to us now? And this of course will open up a future, but the focus of the prophecy is not on the future. In the same way, the book of Revelation is not a kind of coded uh, way to tell us what's going to happen 10 or 50 or 100 years from now. It's, it's, it's telling us the meaning of history, the meaning of life in the light of the mystery of Jesus. And this has a past dimension, as I said, from scripture. It has a present dimension because it's written for some communities in Asia Minor, but we can also apply it to our own time. And it opens up, of course, a future for us, but the accent is not on the future. The other thing about the time of the apocalypse is this sense of urgency. In apocalyptic writing, there's often a very clear sense of urgency. At the beginning it says, this will happen soon, the time is near, he is coming. And all of this people might say, well if that's true, why is 2,000 years past and we're still reading this same book? Well, the, the answer to that is, the time of the apocalypse is not our human time. It's, it's at the time of God. This, these, these words like soon, urgent, he, he's coming, it, uh, are a way of saying this is something urgent, this is something important. This is not something you can put aside and wait till you're ready. When God comes into your life, God asks for a response. And so this, this urgency is important, but we shouldn't try to interpret it in chronological uh, ways according to our own time. 
So, just to say then, when we use this word apocalypse, we shouldn't think of just some kind of catastrophe or some kind of strange uh, interpretation of the future, but it's a reflection on the meaning of our life, on the meaning of history in the light of Jesus Christ, using symbols from the Hebrew Scriptures.